Hi, Eurydice. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, Josh. It's nice to talk to you. So I wanted to have you on because uh, I've been enjoying your tweets for a while now and uh, have had this pretty consistent feeling that you and I have discussed, but of like there being a lot of mystery around who you are and where you're coming from. And I think a lot of the things that you share are fascinating to me. And uh, I wanted to get a better sense of the kind of worldview and perspective that you're coming in with as you share those things. And I was hoping we can uh, unfold that a bit in this conversation. But to begin, I'd love to hear from you about your background and life story and anything you'd like to share about yourself and uh, your sort of personal biography. You can share it whatever length you like and whatever way you like. Hmm. Let's see. Well, I grew up in Utah and I grew up in the Mormon church or they generally prefer to be referred to as the full name of the church. So that's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'll use Mormon because I grew up using it and it's easier. But just as note, so I grew up in that faith and uh, I went to BYU and then I served a mission for the church because I really felt like that was an important, valuable thing for me to do. And uh, over the course of my mission, I had a lot of significant changes in how I oriented to my idea of God and of my own being existence, if you will. And I came home and wrestled privately as much as I was capable of with that change. And then I left the faith and moved across the country for grad school. And I spent several years in grad school. And then dropped out and moved back across the country. And now I am here. Wow, wonderful. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good encapsulation of a uh, of your life, and I think um, just hearing the different elements of that, it's uh, making sense of, oh yeah, that's like a very different life than I've led, and really curious to hear a lot more about specific parts of that, and um, you know, I, I grew up in New England, so geographically, but also I think culturally quite far away from uh, the Mormons, and I wonder if you could kind of pretend that I knew absolutely nothing about the Church of Latter-day Saints. And, you know, I know slightly more than that, but how you would talk about the church to someone that knew very little. So I definitely did a fair amount of that as a missionary. Mm -hmm. And at least a little bit of it uh, when I was in grad school, I was in Baltimore for grad school, and I found that there were dramatically fewer Mormons and people who knew Mormons by extension. In Baltimore. So if I were going to talk about basics of the church with someone with no familiarity with it, I think um, it's a much newer religion than many. It is often, people will often talk about how strikingly American it is as a faith. Most people are familiar with Joseph Smith, the founder, and um, some of his stories of starting the faith of finding a record of peoples who lived in America between, I don't know, 600 BC and a few hundred years after the coming of Christ and records that include descriptions of Christ coming to America. Um, as uh, in, doctrinally, Mormons are believe in a salvific Messiah. They believe in uh, that Jesus Christ was the savior and that his sacrifice was necessary for everyone's salvation. Uh, they believe in creation myth, uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Book of Mormon is the, according to the faith, the record of these uh, people in the Americas that Joseph Smith found. Uh, they highlight a lot of, they're, they're big on agency, especially, and on ideas on being an agent to act and not an object to be acted upon and using that to become more like God through this earth experience. I'm curious, I know like if I told a friend about uh, the Torah or the New Testament, I would be, I would say something like, oh yeah, I read them and uh, there were certain parts that I really liked and certain parts that I was not as, uh, enamored of and you know these were the the books that I did like and these were 
the ones I didn't. And I'm curious how you would describe the Book of Mormon to someone else and if there are any like specific uh, parts of it that you still resonate with or, or find value in. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I would describe the Book of Mormon very differently depending on who I was talking to. Mm. I think people are reasonably extremely skeptical of it because of its origin story. And I wouldn't want to press anyone too hard on <sighs> this book is. Um, I wouldn't want to disabuse someone of that notion too hard. I think it's reasonable to have some skepticism about the origin of the church, uh, given how deeply implausible it sounds, frankly. Uh, so it is a book that focuses a lot on preparing for the coming of Christ, of being aware that there was going to be a savior. And then uh, it tells the story of Christ's visit to the Americas. And uh, one of many sticking points for people who are suspicious of the Book of Mormon, I would say, but is that the book itself is, claims, to, claims that it is a, a record of a people who left Jerusalem around 600 BC and came to the North American continent, maybe the South American continent, and it follows them and their descendants throughout time, which uh, is definitely a testable claim on some level. And there's a lot of apologetics you could get into. But what is meaningful for me, the Book of Mormon always had a great deal of meaning for me. It's something that you are encouraged to read and read frequently as a member. And there are still passages that have a great deal of meaning for me, even though my relationship to both the faith and to God have changed so much since the last time I read it in full. There is, I would say there are a few chapters that stick out to me. One chapter is early on, uh, the narrator who first starts up the book, his name is Nephi, talks to his father dies, and he's talking about his anguish in the face of that and the responsibility that he has and that he feels, and uh, it's this very vulnerable chapter on being aware of his profound imperfectness and how he can never match, match up to who he would want to be. Um, that he feels that he's constantly falling short and not doing good enough and he talks about referring back to God and the knowledge that God uh, will provide him strength despite his limitations and that God cares for him despite his limitations. That passage always held a lot of meaning for me. Another one that I consider very valuable is a discussion of the um, Edenic myth. So Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Mormon church has some unusual theology around that in that they, they believe that the fall was a fundamentally necessary step in the progression of the whole plan because every individual human being needed to be able to progress to become more like God and without a knowledge of good and evil, without a capacity to die and give birth according to uh, Mormon interpretations of this story, it would be impossible to become more like God unless they left Eden. And so Eve's choice was a critical turning point and a valuable necessary turning point. Uh, and that chapter, which talks about a lot of these ideas, has a specific scripture that is frequently quoted that says, Adam fell that men may be and men are that they may have joy. And which obviously is meaningful. I am drawn to optimism and purpose in construction of human existence probably because I grew up in the States. And there, that chapter also focuses a great deal on the importance of the fall for Adam and Eve 
being able to make choices for themselves and how those choices shape their ability to become more like God. That they can act out of knowledge of what is good and bad and troubleshoot, iterate, become better, and expand themselves and their sphere of influence because of that knowledge. And that has also always been very meaningful to me. I'm curious how you would describe the faith sort of um, the people that are, you know, that the Mormons and um, almost like culturally or sociologically or anthropologically, like what, what are, what are, what is the culture like? Well, I can best speak for Northern Utah Mormonism Mm. because that's what I know. It is at least a marginally different phenomenon elsewhere in the U S and it's certainly very different culturally across the globe but the mormonism that i grew up in culturally people are high trust they're extremely agreeable noticeably more agreeable than everybody else and people will talk about this there is a really noticeable discomfort with contention with bringing up uncomfortable things there is uh, an orientation to concepts of politeness and sweeping things under the rug that mirrors what I've seen in, say, the Midwest culturally, at least a little bit. And there is definitely an emphasis on the importance of hard work, on the importance of self-reliance, on being able to take care of yourself and those around you. So. Mormonism is set up even structurally to encourage communities of people to look out for one another and to do things for each other and that is borne out in the culture in large measure there is an effort to look out for the people who are in your congregation and to pitch in take care of them where possible Hmm. And what was your mission like? Like, what did you do? And uh, can you tell me more about that experience? That was, I knew that was going to be a challenging experience. And I went because I felt more strongly than I have felt about most things that it was something that I was supposed to do. And that was the only reason I was willing to go because I didn't particularly want to. I had recently graduated with my bachelor's degree and I was looking forward to going to grad school and it put a significant wrench in my plans to suggest that I should be going on a mission. But I decided to trust that impulse, that feeling that it was something important for me to do that I was supposed to do. It was brutally difficult and isolating in ways that I was prepared for but could not have appreciated the severity of from the outside and then it was also difficult in ways I had no frame of reference for and was not expecting so the rules have changed a little bit now for reasons that will probably become clear if I talk about them But when I served a mission, you were not supposed to call anyone you knew from home except for Mother's Day and Christmas, you were allowed to make calls to your family. Hmm. So uh, you, you could make video calls two days a year to family members that you knew. You could email them once a week. You had time every Monday set aside for you to be able to take care of everything that wasn't proselyting. So that would be, you had a set number of hours where you could get your laundry done and your grocery shopping done and write letters or emails to your family members. And it was, and the rest of the time, you were expected to either be teaching lessons to people, whether they were current members of the church, people who are interested in joining, or people you were talking to on the street encouraging to join, uh, or you were supposed to be looking for service opportunities occasionally. The, the church does have missions that are intended to be service missions, 
but proselyting missions are designed for you to prioritize talking to people on the street, teaching them lessons, encouraging people to get baptized and become members of the church. I, I like to joke that before I left on my mission, I was probably 50-50 split on introversion, extroversion. And after getting home from my mission, I was like, I am never talking to someone I don't have to talk to ever again. I won't do it because the expectation as a missionary is that you talk to every single person that you see on the street and that you are supposed to stop them and try to engage them in conversation and try to share a spiritual thought with them, something. And this is challenging on its own because it feels very unpleasant to have to engage with people with that much of an agenda, even if you really do believe and care about what you're sharing with people. And there was a really heavy layer of guilt on failing to talk to someone you walk past, which is, that was excruciating for me, even as someone who doesn't have that much trouble talking to people I don't know. And this experience also came with all of these positives of, it was fascinating talking to people about what they believed in, about what mattered to them and about how they understood their place in the world. And I frequently found myself feeling like I wished that I could just explore what was important to them instead of feeling like I had to offer some of what was important to me with an agenda rather than just as a comparison. But I really valued so many of the really brief connections that I made with people as I talked to them about how they understood the world and what was important to them. It was isolating to be separate from everyone. There were strict rules on taking time off, on having downtime. You were mostly expected to be out talking to people and or teaching lessons between the hours of 9 or 10 a.m. and 9 or 10 p.m. And there was a lot, again, a lot of guilt associated with even taking breaks at any point in that. And I found it very wearing, and I found that it sort of pinched me into being a version of myself that I didn't like very much, hmm. which was... unsettling unpleasant it's hard to describe exactly how that felt but that was one of several things that was difficult for me it's unlike anything else i've ever done though how did they encourage you to approach the act of proselytizing sort of rhetorically can you be more specific well, I'm imagining that they had some kind of like training or encouragement of like, here's what you're doing and why and how to go about it. And I'd be curious what they told you about that. Oh, absolutely. Those were really uh, attempts to reinforce how we should be proselyting were consistently worked into the experience of being a missionary. So you start off with, for me, I didn't learn a language or leave the country. So I was only in what's called the Missionary Training Center or MTC for two weeks. Other missionaries who learn languages spend six to nine weeks. I don't know about now, but again, when I served six to nine weeks, learning the language as well as learning how to approach people. So you'll do role plays on talking to someone on the street versus talking to someone in a lesson and potentially inviting them to be baptized. That's a really popular one to role play and practice and then as a missionary once a week you have meetings with other missionaries who serve roughly in your same city and then once a month you would have meetings with other missionaries who serve in a slightly larger re region and then occasionally you would have meetings with missionaries who were all in your same geographical mission which is usually about the size of a state but it does depend on the, mish, the member presence there. All of this 
was geared towards both reinforcing missionaries' understanding of the doctrine and the way that they were expected to teach the doctrine, and also giving you some tips on how to interface with people. And it was always this really strange combination of fun, honestly. Like, I enjoyed these meetings, especially because they meant that I was hanging out with other missionaries and not with badgering strangers about Jesus, but <laughs> you'd be talking to well, it was welcome respite to listen to somebody teach me how to give a sales pitch on God instead mm. of having to be hassling some poor person who just wants to read their book on the bus. <laughs> but I always felt so guilty doing that. I'd be like, I would hate me so much right now. Mm. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to do this. Um, but yeah, so there, there would be this mix of talking about the doctrine and reinforcing the pieces that were most important in teaching people. And then here's how to not freak people out while you're cold approaching them on the street about God. Hmm. Do you have any memories from specific conversations that you had uh, on your mission, like proselytizing conversations? Many. Hmm. Uh, one that sticks out, I had experiences that were sort of similar to this all over my mission the most notable one was it was an easter sunday i believe or the weekend of passover maybe and i was working in a congregation that was intended for single adults between the ages of 18 and 31 so we went to a college campus and we got, I believe we got permission to do this. It's not impossible that we didn't, but I think we did. <laughs> we got permission to go to a college campus and set up a table with a few pictures of Christ and some brochures. And we would talk to people who came by about the church, give them a card with our number on it. And these two men came up to us and they were 40s, maybe 50s and started asking us questions about some of the more controversial claims of Mormonism, which include claims around the nature of God, around the nature of um, what came before God kind of thing. There are some esoteric Mormon doctrines that get brought up a lot, especially if you are Christian and familiar with it from the outside. And they came up to us and they were quoting scriptures from uh, Isaiah 53 that, and from some other passages and asking us some pretty intense questions about the Mormon uh, concept of God as they understood it. And they were being fairly uncompromising and not just along the line of unkind and uh, challenging, I would say. I remember distinctly, and I wrote home about this, I remember thinking that this was what I, this was how I should expect to be treated given that this was something I actively chose to do. That I kind of, that I signed up for people challenging me on what was important to me and for people who reasonably cared as deeply as I did about my faith being willing to confront me so directly about my faith that this was something I signed up for and that it made sense and that I should not expect better treatment, I think, given that that was something that I willingly signed up to do. Hmm. Were there any other uh, memorable stories that you'd like to share? Hmm. There were definitely some interesting stories with companions. So you get assigned to work with one other person for six week period so you might and we call those transfers those six week blocks of time so you might be with someone for one transfer it's more common to be with them for two or three and you are not allowed to leave their site 
unless one of you is in the bathroom or if you're in the apartment together, you can, you don't have to be in the same room all the time. And you spend an ex obviously an extraordinary amount of time with that person. And most of my companions, I genuinely loved and had a wonderful time working with. I had two who were difficult for very different reasons. And I reflected a lot as a missionary on the ways that other people bothered me at such close quarters that seemed petty and not good enough, not noble <laughs> enough to feel. And yet I found myself sitting with these petty frustrations and having no idea of what to do with them. And I would think a lot about getting married in the future because as a good Mormon kid, I like I hadn't had sex. I certainly had never lived with a man. Um, the idea of having to have a relationship someday with somebody else that I lived with and find a way to live with them when I was so clearly set off and annoyed by all these stupid, silly, petty things was a daunting and sort of unnerving idea for me. At the time. Hmm. Did you ever find a solution to that? I think I found some solutions later on outside of the context of being a missionary one of the ways in which I would say that being a missionary compressed my personality with great loss of fidelity and good things <laughs> that shouldn't have disappeared is that there's a lot of pressure on women especially, but on missionaries in general, not to be negative, which means that especially women in the church, honestly, but particularly as missionaries, you do a lot of shoving your feelings down as far as they will go and pretending that you are happy. Hmm. And I was really, I was really good at the shoving the feelings down part, <laughs> but I was not a good, well, I could, I could fake the happiness, but I hated it. And I hated myself doing it. I value authenticity. And I always had, and I always felt like that was something that the church that God wanted from me was authenticity, genuineness, my real self. And this focus on being nice and everything looking good on, from the outside at the cost of all else made me feel like I had to fake it and I had to be, I had to put on a smile and pretend like things that bothered me didn't bother me and pretend like, and just try to grit my teeth through things that I didn't want to deal with. And I had never considered myself a passive aggressive person before my mission and I certainly I, I don't think most people would have accused me of being a passive aggressive person before my mission or after it but I noticed that I was increasingly passive aggressive because these messy feelings would spill out around the edges of my efforts to shut them down and so out of that context briefly yeah i i have a better ability to be honest and upfront and i think there is a great wealth of things that are much easier to solve if you are honest about what is going on so you're sort of not artificially constrained anymore to like appear positive and you could say something that might be uncomfortable for someone but that's more honest to your experience now generally and i mm -hmm. think i also have a greater capacity to put distance between myself and a person who is not hmm. a good fit for me if it's if something that bothers me about them is just kind of how they are as a person not necessarily a negative just an incompatibility between the two of us mm -hmm. whereas you are assigned a companion there's not much you can do can't so, leave yeah no mm -mm. Yeah. you just put up or shut up yes wow Huh. And you said that during your mission, uh, things started to change for you. What, what started to change and how did you start to see the world during that time? There are a lot of aspects of that that would be hard for me to talk about in detail. Mm -hmm. 
but my understanding of my life trajectory moving forward changed dramatically as a missionary in part because all of my life plans were set on hold for 18 months and I had to figure out a way to make sure that I had runway when I got back. And as I tried to construct a future for myself, I found that there were limitations that had always been there in some form that I had been blind to and limitations that were baked in to my very existence. And it was very painful for me to grapple with those things. And it was painful for me to reorient to how I understood my place and how I understood my worth in relation to God. As I reflected on those things, I reevaluate a lot of what I understood to be my connection to a divine spiritual father, which is how uh, Mormons model God. And that's a little too much. And it was extremely painful, and I did so on my own because there wasn't really a way to talk about the way that womanhood affected my relationship with God with any of the male leaders that surrounded me in the church because the church is exclusively led, again, by men. And I didn't really have anyone to talk to about this experience, most women in the church could not relate at the level that I was experiencing those things. And it was certainly a game changer, a massive tectonic shift in my whole model of the world, of the universe, and my place in it. In brief, how would you say you saw the world before the shift, and how would you say you started to see it afterwards? So before I understood myself as one of billions of infinitely precious individuals who were literal children of a divine set of parents, and that everything about this world was designed for them to grow and become better, become more of who they could be. And in particular, I had always felt a very personal connection to God. I had always felt like who I was mattered enormously to him. And a part of the Mormon view of messianic sacrifice that was particularly meaningful to me is the idea that Christ not only suffered for the sins of mankind, but that he individually knows the pain and suffering and grief of every human experience, whether or not that is connected to anyone's sin. So there is a scripture, I think it's Isaiah 53, 6. It's not particularly important what the reference is, but that says he was bruised for our iniquities and with his stripes we are healed. And mm. doctrine, the LDS doctrine tends to talk about that as one scriptural foothold for this idea that Christ suffered not only for the wrongdoing that you did to other people, but for the grief that you experienced and for the pain and for the suffering. And I always found a lot of meaning in this idea of having, as Mormons model it, an elder brother who considered me so valuable that I was worth suffering all of that on my behalf and that my suffering was by extension understood at an impossibly granular level by a perfect being. That was a very meaningful symbol of my worth and by extension of the worth of every single person around me. 
uh, there's a C.S. Lewis quote that I really value from his essay called The Weight of Glory, where he talks about it being a serious thing to be surrounded by a society of possible gods and goddesses that the most miserable creature around you might one day be a being that if you saw them now, you might feel tempted to worship. And I oriented to both myself and to other people with this sense of infinite potential and profound value just by existence. And the loss of my relationship to God was a loss of most of that architecture, I would say. And it was a profound grief that I did not have anyone to share with because everyone I knew who was still in the faith could only see my grief and say, well, that's because you left the church. Like, uh, obviously, obviously you're sad because you walked away from the truth, you dumb bitch. Like, if you were not doing this, like, there would be, they wouldn't say this, this is a profoundly non-woman way to, <laughs> just to be clear, uh, this is, this is my commentary, my wording, but uh, so it was a grief that I, I felt like I went through by myself, especially because a lot of people who leave the church don't leave for <sighs> the reasons I did. I really haven't ever met anyone who left the church for the reasons that I did. Uh, there are a lot of very reasonable criticisms to make about the church on uh, a historical level, on a doctrinal level, and especially in terms of its history with how it treats people in marginalized groups. There are a lot of really reasonable criticisms and reasonable reasons to be angry at the church. And I would never want to suggest that somebody else who felt that way was overreacting or in the wrong. It was not something that I experienced. And I felt very alone in the loss of something that had been a pillar of my life and my understanding of the universe as a result. To the extent that you feel comfortable sharing it or that you're capable of describing it, what precipitated the loss of your belief in the faith? I don't think that's something that I could talk about mm -hmm. publicly. That is something mm -hmm. that I might share in a private conversation, but mm -hmm. it's, it tends to make a lot of people mad. Mm. Uh, and so <laughs> I usually talk about it with close friends uh, once there's a lot of trust established and once I know that that's something they could handle hearing about. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I'm curious. Uh, well, I want to come back to kind of the worldview that you find yourself in now after having left the church. Um, but I think it might be useful to sort of have a brief interlude. And I would love to hear, uh, again, to whatever extent you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, I, I've sort of inferred that you have uh, some, like, you know, you were studying, you had a bachelor's degree, and then you went back to grad school. Can, can you share anything about uh, what you've sort of studied academically? Oh, absolutely. I come from a family of engineers and academics. And I have my undergraduate degree is in chemical engineering, which I really loved. I always loved math and that particular application of especially calculus, but several different forms of math to modeling physical systems was really enriching for me. I did not want to work in oil and gas as other family members of mine did, and which was the classic chemical engineering path. Hmm. So I had actually one of my older brothers did a chemical engineering path where he went into pharmaceuticals, biomolecular work. And I would talk to him about the protein design work that he was doing. And I found it absolutely fascinating. I had a lot of conversations with him over those years and that he was in grad school actually. And I was really intrigued by it. I, on my mission, I made some attempts to apply to grad school. They were piecemeal and messy and only possible with the help of 
one of my siblings and I didn't get into any of the programs that I applied to while I was in on my mission. And I eventually tried a different tack because I had applied to some programs with a shift away from engineering. I decided to apply for some bio-directed chemical engineering programs and I got in and this so I started in chemical and biomolecular engineering in a PhD program and a series of very serious life events that all kind of happened at once in the first bit of grad school and the mentorship in PhD programs is kind of a Russian roulette. You might be in a place where you have someone who can give you really good training and you might be pretty much on your own to figure out how to do all the work necessary for you to write an entire thesis, publish one or two first author papers and then get out. And it's not always easy to determine which one of those you're going to land in from the outset. So I spent two years in that program. I found that the mentorship was not a good fit for the amount of help that I felt that I needed, but especially I was also experiencing some severe external life distress as well. I transferred to work at the medical campus and I was really interested in working on endometriosis. So I pitched a particular ovarian cancer drug delivery project and the PI that I wanted to work with, the professor I wanted to work with was intrigued by that and let me work in his pathology, brought me in as a PhD student in his pathology program and the dramatic life experiences continued by uh, COVID hit and after all of this sometime in the beginning of January 2021, I was miserable and I felt like it was fairly clear that I was not going to be able to dig myself out of this hole where I was. And so I dropped out. They gave me a master's because I passed all my classes and had been working in a lab for years. I'd passed my qualifying exams and I moved back. I realize you asked for my academic history and we got back into heavy things, but that is the answer to your question. Mm, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Um... I'm curious about, you mentioned that a lot of people in your family had sort of like this engineering scientific background or thinking, and I, I wonder, was there any friction that you noticed between, like, I, I would anticipate from afar that there might be like friction between sort of this contemporary scientific worldview and the Mormon worldview, but do you have a sense of what that was like for your family members or for you? I think that's uh so that question that you just asked is one that I have run into that people have asked me a number of times. And especially as I was leaving the faith, people fairly consistently would be like, oh, it's because you're a scientist, mm -hmm. right? That's what it is. Um, for me and for, for my family members, I never noticed that that tension was particularly strong. I tend to have a Kierkegaardian almost absurdist view on the relation, if there is a God, uh, on the relation, on his relationship to the physical scientific world, which is, I don't think it's out of the question that God does things that make absolutely no sense, basically. Hmm. So it's never been that difficult for me to square. And then I would say Mormonism is unusually well suited to a more scientific mind because uh, some of the Mormon modelings on God include the idea that God is bound by physical laws, which is a, a departure from a lot of Christian theology, which also there are not insignificant number of people who would make an argument for Mormons not being Christian. Uh, and there are plenty of arguments that are logically coherent to that end. This is one sticking point of many. 
for a lot of other Christian faiths, that we, we believe in a God who is bound by physical laws, that he has to work within the physical laws of the universe. And so that leaves a lot of room for possibilities that the physical, observed, measurable world can be made to fit with God as we understand him from the Old Testament and the New, and that we can understand and expand our ability to be more like God by learning more about that world. And <laughs> Mormons in general have a higher number of, this is anecdotal, I'm not sure I would hang my hat, my reputation on this claim, but I do think Mormons produce a few more scientists than a lot of other similarly sized face hmm. hmm. and as you sort of transitioned out of the church you left the church uh found yourself you know trying to make sense of the world on your own would you say that there are any values from your mormon background or upbringing that have persisted even as you've left the church profoundly something that was interesting about i i left the church roughly the same time i went to grad school and I had this idea that I could just pretend none of it ever happened and I would be fine. This, as you might imagine, was optimistic. Mm. And I, I found that it was in my bloodstream, in my bone marrow, in a way that was never coming out. That the way I was raised was baked into who I was as a person in a way that could be molded and shaped, but it was never going to be changeable on a fundamental level. So a lot of, a lot of my ethical systems still borrow a lot from critical Mormon concepts that were important to me at the time. I've never been able to abandon ideas of the infinite value of other human beings. Um, I am, I find strictly hierarchical views of people to be extremely distasteful. Hobbesian views are anathema to me. I can understand them intellectually, but I hate them. And I value other people as, as much as possible. My ethical system comes from a belief that other people deserve the best of me and that all of us should be striving to be to do right by the people around us because we are all that we have. Uh, in conjunction with that, Mormonism places a lot of emphasis, as I've mentioned, on agency. And a lot of my views obviously talk about agency too. And I think in Mormonism, the idea that you're expanding your ability to act on the world, you're expanding your capacity to make good happen. That's part of becoming more like God. For me, now, there is a retained attitude that the more I make things happen in my life, the more I make choices, even in the face of overwhelming odds or fearfulness, the more intentional I am, the more good things I can make happen. And the more that I make choices, the more power effectively that I have, the more good I can do. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just digesting that. Um, I think you, you and I had a call uh, a couple of months ago, and we were talking about a lot of this. And uh, you described yourself as, as still being culturally Mormon, even if you don't <laughs> adhere to the faith. And um, yeah, I wonder if you could say more about that and what that still means to you in your everyday life these days. I tend to use culturally Mormon in the way that some of this feels maybe inappropriate as a comparison to make, but I definitely borrow the verbiage from people I knew who grew up in Judaism, mm -hmm. who will talk about being culturally Jewish, and they, they don't feel any particular connection to the doctrines on a belief level 
but a lot of the practices still hold a great deal of meaning for them. And part of what I was getting at when I was talking about Mormonism not really coming out in the wash, that it's not really something I can undo about who I am as a person, is that a lot of the ways I orient to the world will always have a fundamentally Mormon bent. And there, my, my heritage, my traditions, everything about my culture, including my musical upbringing, my exposure to a lot of Christian writings, all of those come from a very specific Mormon cultural niche. The recipes I make come from a very specific Mormon cultural niche, overwhelmingly. So I retain all of this culture, all of this passed down trappings that go with this faith that I came from, despite the fact that my, my relationship to it as an orthodoxy has changed profoundly. I have a lot of connections to and find a lot of value and warmth and hominess in these pieces of culture that retain, that are, that I grew up with, that I associate with home. So one of the more boring examples of this, I think, is, and more legible examples would be that Mormons have a global broadcast of all of the church leaders, the very top church leaders, so there's 12 apostles in the church structure, and then there's what's called a first presidency, the president of the church, or the prophet, as he is known to members, and he has two counselors. So those 15 men all give talks that are broadcast across the world two times a year. And it's called General Conference. It happens in April and October, the first week end of those months respectively. And I associate General Conference Weekend so much with my childhood, with the experience of wrapping up in a blanket on the couch and falling asleep to some nice old man talking. And they, they, I still have this really deep affection for them. I have been known in the last several years, more than once, to put on General Conference <laughs> When it's streaming in the background when it is on because it is such a connection to childhood to where I came from. Hmm. To be fair, this is unusual for people who have left the <laughs> want to make Yeah. It yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, this is part of the reason I ask is really wanting to get a sense of your ethical worldview. And I think this background feels like really critical to understanding that. And, you know, as, as I said earlier, quite, quite foreign to me of, you know, not something I'm culturally very familiar with. And it's sort of helping me to make sense of where you're coming from in terms of the things that you talk about. Um, there's a thread that I found, uh, you know, I was kind of looking through a bunch of your tweets and I'll, I'll probably refer to others, but there's a thread that I found that I'd like to ask you about. And um, there's a, it's a three tweet thread and I'll read them all because I think there's pieces in each of them that would be worth diving into. Um, the the uh, sort of gist of it is about uh, left and right politics and integrity from Mormonism. And so you said, I really hope I still have few enough followers who have me unmuted that I can say that I wish the left talked about integrity more. It's probably the Mormonism in me, but that framing that you should be grounded in a set of consistent values governing what you owe to yourself and to others resonates deeply with me. I have a lot of leftist values and I find it easier to use conservative framings on how to live them in my personal life. So um, I have at least two questions about this, but maybe just to start, um, I like that you describe integrity as a set of consistent values governing what you owe to yourself and to others. And I wonder if you could add some kind of uh, detail to what that might look like practically to manifest that understanding of integrity? I think integrity is being able to say that you are wrong when you are wrong and also not backing down when you are right. Hmm. And I think people default to one or the other, but a person with perfect integrity would always be able to identify where they are letting themselves or other people down or both. They would also be able to identify and stand firm in their convictions 
when other people needed to step up, to say, no, what you are saying is wrong, what you are asking for is wrong, and I will not collude in the pretense that it is right, and at the same time, when they are held to a standard by someone else, when someone says, you have fallen short, they are capable of evaluating their own actions honestly enough to be able to say, no, I did the right thing here, or you are right, I fell short of my values and what I ought to have offered to other people, and I will correct that. Can you tell me any examples of times that you've either uh, stood up for your values or admitted that you were wrong about something? I, let me think of, Somewhat obviously, this is not an easy thing to do at the margins, identifying where you are wrong and identifying where it is right to stand up for yourself. I would say that there have been many circumstances, particularly in close relationships with family members or friends or romantic partners, where they have made choices that I could stand firm in my convictions and say, this is not an acceptable way to act. And I understand why you did it, maybe in some cases. It continues to be unacceptable and it is not something that I will allow you to call good or appropriate. And on the flip side, I put a lot of effort into evaluating my choices, especially in the aftermath of choices and I personally have an ethic of apologizing when I identify that I fell short of my value system rather than waiting for somebody else to tell me that I wronged them. I think taking the initiative and apologizing is a better way to live up to values than waiting for somebody else to serve charges essentially. Hmm. And I think that there, so I do my best to look through my conduct, especially in intimate relationships, and say to myself, I knew I was unfair here. I knew that I did not offer this person what they deserved here. And to the best of my ability, aspirationally, I like to hope that I go to people and proactively say, this was less than what you deserved and less than what I was capable of. And in a weak moment or in a fit of peak, frequently, I did, I behaved in a way that was beneath what you deserved. And I'm sorry. And I think that orienting to those apologies in a way that really works to understand how the other person felt about the situation is a critically important part of mending human relationships and of treating other people with the dignity that they deserve. And I want to dive in as well to the last point that you made about um, having a lot of leftist, leftist values and <laughs> finding it easier to use conservative framings on how to lift them or hold them. What, what exactly does that mean? Like, what are the leftist values that you hold and what does it mean to hold them in a more conservative style? Okay, so I want to acknowledge that these tweets came from like the first week that I had this mm -hmm. account, uh -huh. which- It's been a little while. I, that account, if I probably had like 40 followers, if that, when I wrote this. Mm -hmm. And I made this account thinking that I was going to have it for two weeks to scream into the void because I was upset and then I was gonna deactivate it and go uh -huh. back to not being on Twitter. So uh -huh. I, I wrote that in a very different framing than I, I would write tweets today. Mm. I certainly would never talk explicitly about my values and where they fall in the political spectrum at mm. this point. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So I don't know how much I would specify leftist values. I think everybody, or at least a good deal of people look at values through a glass darkly, especially when it comes to people they disagree with. I 
think there's a lot of value in trying to see the best in other people's viewpoints. I do believe deeply in treating other people with dignity and in obviously the value of other people. And there are system level ways to approach those problems that are valuable and meaningful. And I also think that the interpersonal is critical and that a fundamental model of other people as being profoundly valuable and deserving of your best self, that, that is important to me. And I believe that is more or less what I was thinking of when I wrote that tweet, mm -hmm. those tweets. I want to come back to some of the specific views that you have on ethics and action, but I, I want to, I don't want to pass up asking, you said uh, something to the effect of, you know, I, I wouldn't put it that way now, or I would write things differently or not talk about this now. What, what sort of shifted for you over time as you have had the account about how you use it and what you write about and how you approach sharing about the things that you're interested in? I was talking about this on a space the other day. It's very funny to me what has happened with this account because I was thoroughly unprepared for the trajectory it has taken. Mm. I, one of my pets died unexpectedly and mm. I made a Twitter account because I had still somewhat recently moved across the country. I didn't really have any friends and I was really upset about it. And I just wanted somewhere to barf messy, ugly feelings for a while. Hmm. That is why I made this account and I made it, I'd had multiple Twitter accounts before I had concluded multiple times before that Twitter was not a good use of my energy and that it was not a good way for me to spend time. But I made this account out of this sort of fatalistic, everything sucks, I don't care if I indulge in this unhealthy pastime for a while. I want somewhere to say that I'm unhappy where other people can see it. And then I'll leave once I, like, I will, I will get rid of this account. I had a different username when I started it, everything. And sure, a week or two after starting the account, I got, I already got much more engagement than I expected. I set up this account in Teapot, having discovered it and having had one account in Teapot very briefly a few months prior because nobody knew me there and I, I didn't want to be caught or found out. I have a very distinctive writing style and people mm. tend to recognize me if I have any proximity to other Twitter users that know me. So I set up shop somewhere where people didn't know me. And after a little while, some of the friends that I made through this account, one of them reached out to me and said, it's, it's sad that you don't have a profile picture that your bio is, I think my bio was like, I shouldn't be here or like, I'm, hopefully I will be leaving soon. It was like something along those lines. My handle was like, shouldn't, <laughs> um, something like that. And I had someone reach out to me and say, you know, you're such a welcome presence. You have such interesting things to say. It's just, it's sad to me that your, your account is framed around all of these negatives. And I re I thought about figures that I wanted to be associated with. There's a lot about the Eurydice myth that is meaningful for me. I found a sculpture by someone of Eurydice and used that as my profile picture. And I changed the background to a photo I had taken on my cross country move from grad school and uh, re changed my bio to we sing it anyway. Hmm. which is a line from Hades Town, which is a musical about the Eurydice myth and tangentially about the Persephone Hades myth. I found very quickly after this shift, which is where I became more visible as a woman, especially if you know any Greek mythology. In Mormon Twitter, I could talk about my ideas on dating and sex and gender, and they were just kind of pedestrian. There was nothing particularly interesting about them. They didn't garner a lot of attention. It was what it was. Um, but I found in Teapot that when I talked about my feelings on marriage or dating or sex, 
it got colossally more engagement than I was prepared for. And it was really interesting because especially early on, people would accuse me of engagement baiting by gender posting and dating posting. And I was like, mm. like <laughs> this shit just lives in my head. It's just what I think <laughs> about. It bothers me. And so I tweet about it. And <laughs> in like, in other places, people weren't this weird about it. Like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> this is mm. not, I did not get this much attention on Mormon Twitter talking like this. <laughs> and so I found that my follower account expanded rapidly. There were also a lot of figures in Teapot who consistently posted things that I was like, why is nobody calling you on your shit? Where, mm. where is someone to come and say, hello, this is bullshit. You do know that, right? Like you are saying dumb shit. Like, which was, I, I should not acknowledge how much of a factor that was in my early Twitter account, but it's obvious to anyone who's paying attention. Uh, and then this resulted in like a really fast follower account expansion <laughs> really quickly. I have like triple the followers I have ever had before on any account, despite the fact that I had accounts for way longer than this in the past. And I have been aware as my follower account has expanded that there are types of engagement that I don't want. And to the best of my ability, I try to tweet with a sense of responsibility to my future self. That sounds so much stodgier than how I think of it, which is just like, if I, if I say some dumb shit and somebody tells me I said dumb shit, that's kind of on me. Like I should be reviewing what I'm tweeting before I just barf it out there if I don't want to hear like if I don't want certain kinds of responses I have a certain level of responsibility to myself not to tweet things that would foreseeably get me engagement that I hate hmm. so as my follower account grows that accountability grows and I put more effort into what am I willing to say in front of this many people <sighs> that will have responses that I think I am willing to deal with. Hmm. There's a wide range of responses that I'm willing to deal with, but there are plenty that I do not want to receive. And I do make efforts not to tweet things that will get me engagement that I'll be like, I hate this, you suck, go away. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the choice of Eurydice as a figure, can you say some more about what appeals to you about that myth? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, Where to start? Obviously, I'm given to monologuing. I, I particularly like the way the myth is told in Hades Town, the musical and the concept album. And I had discovered it semi recently when I dropped out of grad school and when I moved. And in particular, I listened to the soundtrack with my friend who drove across the country with me when I moved. She'd never heard it before. And this idea of being, of choosing to follow a person who didn't have your best interests at heart and finding yourself in hell and walking out of hell, especially only to be let down at the very last moment, there was a lot that was resonant for me in that. Uh, particularly my experience in grad, grad school was honestly five years of novel forms of misery that mm. I could never have predicted would be part of my life story. Mm. And I found that I was always at the end of the road having to fix shit, having to take care of myself, having to scrape myself off the asphalt again and again and again, and moving from coast to coast was partially a response to a sense that I wanted to change everything about my life that I possibly could. And I have found a lot of frustration and despair and I have spent a lot of time 
angry at the things I have been responsible for fixing in my life. And I liked the idea of a myth where there was no Orpheus. And I, in particular, found that I resonated with the idea of having walked myself out of hell, that I was alone in making a trek out of murky, swampy darkness towards what I hoped was going to be light someday. And the handle is Eurydice Lives. I have a tweet somewhere that I will quote tweet at people sometimes when they mention it, that I'm my own Orpheus and therefore I live, that I made it out of hell because there was no one else to look back at me and no one else to let me down that I walked myself out of the experience that I had had. And my bio is, we sing it anyway, which I mentioned. The first and last songs, almost first and last songs of Hades Town the Musical are the same song. And they're a reprise. And they both talk about telling this story this sad, this tragedy of Orpheus and Eurydice and telling it over and over again as if it might turn out this time. And specifically it talks about Orpheus being able to make you see the way the world could be in spite of the way that it is. And when I couldn't find any good reason that I had to stick my hand into mud and ugliness and again and again to try and fix what was wrong in my life. I resonated with at least this idea of we will sing this song despite the fact that we know it ends tragically. We will sing it anyway. We will make sense of, we will walk this path, do this thing, because it matters, even if it ends tragically. And I have, it's actually a Tumblr post <laughs> that I will also tweet when I talk about this, where it says that good catharsis and tragedy, a large measure of it comes from how soothing it is to have someone hold your hand and tell you that this story mattered, even though it went so wrong, even though everything went terribly wrong, even though everything ended horribly, their story mattered anyway. That it just feels good to know that what happens matters, even when it ends horribly. And all of that was kind of encapsulated for me in this one line. Hmm. We hmm. sing it anyway. Hmm. Uh, it's nice to hear about the sort of backstory of that. So thank you for sharing. Um, Thanks for asking. You mentioned as well that uh, there was sort of a theme of thinking that people were saying things that were wrong and uh, wanting to make them aware of their bullshit. And I wonder if, you know, you don't need to get into specifics if you want, don't want to, but if just more <laughs> like if there were any themes of the kinds of things that you found yourself saying, like, that's bullshit. There are consistent blind spots in this community that mm. show up frequently. And I think that it can use a little bit more poking as a reminder, especially as a community that considers itself one that values real data, real experiences, and understanding the world as it is and not as it would be convenient to believe it is. Mm -hmm. hmm. That reminds me of one of the tweets that I dug up. You said, 
well, this is two, but you said teapot is for people who are incredibly smart in most ways and catastrophically <laughs> stupid in at least one critical way. And then you said the optimal amount of upsetting people is non-zero. Uh, can you say more about that, uh, about like why, why that would be the case? I can imagine, but I'd love to hear you describe it. I should be clear that those two tweets are from separate time periods. I uh -huh. went through my alt recently and really embarrassingly just found a lot of tweets that I was like, this is hilarious. Oh, oh this yes. On me. Yes. So <laughs> yes. that entire, this thread that you're taking those two tweets from is all a series of those. So those are, those were separated in time and they were probably prompted by different things. Right. Okay. So not actually connected. In. Yes. I think, so the, the first about teapot being for people that is partially poking fun at myself as much as it is poking fun at other people. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a little gauche to say now that I think about it. I'm sorry about that. But Oh, I love that about you, my friend. I love that. <laughs> uh, I think you've said this on a few occasions. I forget where, but just like, oh, yeah, like if I'm, you know, being critical of something, it's because I've done it myself. I wish that were always true. I am uh -huh. also very good at being sanctimonious about things that I <laughs> am not given to fucking up in a specific way and I can be mm -hmm. very ungenerous with people who have problems I can't relate to it's mm. not a particularly winsome quality of mine but I do I do recognize in myself some things about me that are just like I have no excuse for being so bad at this thing like I look at it and I'm like this is just this is hilarious like you know the right answer <laughs> you're just sitting here bitching about it good job five stars mm. you're doing great work and i do i do think it is funny to look around teapot and see the ways that like I, I, uh, the much more generous way to talk about this is that teapot is largely a community of ideological refugees who mm. are running away from a faith or a political idea or both uh, or even a philosophy. And I think there's a unifying factor of being unusually skilled and also unusually struggling because of the unique ways that that kind of difficulty will affect your life and your personality. Can you say a little bit more about some of the blind spots that you tend to see in the community? <laughs> mm. 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 Oh. So you remember me talking before about how I try to tweet with a sense of responsibility to myself mm -hmm. for the kind of shit and pushback that I'm willing to deal with. Mm. I am making one of those calculuses. Uh -huh. Well, yes, we, we care about right speech on this podcast, so feel free to say whatever you like in whatever way you like, including abstaining. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to think if there's a coy way to talk about it, so I'm not being... Um, I think there are experiences that are foreign to a majority of community members that get treated as if they are either not real like they don't happen at all or that people are exaggerating them and i think a lot of the blind spots come from one or both of those places hmm. uh, i'll ask a, a different variant of the same question and feel free <laughs> to be coy or non-responsive as well but it's my job to ask the question so okay. uh <clears throat> are there any themes in the ways that you see people being catastrophically stupid I think a lot of the ways that people are catastrophically stupid are at least genre wise similar to mine. They fall under particular subcategories that I think make sense. I would say there are a lot of people in Teapot, especially myself included, where everyone from the outside, this is really harsh. Is there a better way for me to say this? Probably. <laughs> well, one, one, one that might be available to you, which you don't have to take if you like, but of course, part of the reason I'm asking, you know, to, to zoom out is to, to sort of make use of 
your ethical sensibilities to improve my own character. So, you know, feel free to <laughs> criticize me in ways you see me being catastrophically stupid from afar, if that's useful to you. <laughs> I mean, that would be easier if I more consistently observed you being catastrophically mm. stupid. I am sorry to tell you that is not Alas. something that has been my experience with you, generally speaking. I, I, there are definitely people I have thoughts on, I think. There's a there's a Sasha Chapin tweet from a while back about everybody being able to see your shadow. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're the only person who can't. Mm -hmm. If I were going to talk about this feature of being catastrophically stupid, it would be very at home with that concept of mm -hmm. everyone can see your shadow in many cases much better than you can. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I notice I'm interested partially for myself, as I said, but also on the on the community level, because it, it, this, this is like a neighborhood of questions that I'm asking where like, it would be very easy for you to answer in ways that I would consider unskillful from afar. But there's like, <laughs> there's also like a narrow home run that you could hit where like, you like, <laughs> say something kind and useful in a way that's beneficial to me and the community at large, that's like not unkind or unskillful so i'm giving you the opportunity for a home run here but uh you know it's, it's tricky probability but, space home run it yeah good. <laughs> yeah uh and and much opportunity to fuck up so uh <laughs> i would not encourage you to uh be you know unkind or uncritical of course but um you know uh to the extent i, I think one of the people i've seen talk about this too that i really like is uh and I, I'd, I'd have to dig up the tweets, but Tyler Alterman has talked about like, kind of like the, there's a bias against a, like actual action and service in the world, which I'm sympathetic to. Um, I think that's that's maybe one element of the shadow. And then I think for myself, you know, and I've talked about this with you and also on the podcast, but um, a lot of what I've been wrestling with personally this year has been about uh, like trust and distrust and who is actually my friend and who is not my friend and what are the ways I can trust a specific person or a community and what are the ways I can't. And uh, I think that kind of stuff lurks a bit under the surface as far as I can tell. Interesting. I can see an argument for a bias towards an action in this community and certainly in people at large. It is very easy to believe that a choice you're not making is one that will remain available to you in the same way. And I don't know if people say this outside Mormonism or how much they say it, but you will hear things like a choice delayed is a choice made. <laughs> that if you're going to hang back and not do things out of inaction, out of uncertainty, you will be losing opportunities. They're just less explicit to you. I think a lot of people have a, an inaction bias because the cost of inaction is so much less explicit than the cost of wrong action. That's one thing. And then you mentioned, what's the other idea that you mentioned? Oh, trust and distrust. So the connective tissue I'm seeing from here between these two ideas is that inaction is often prompted by uncertainty. And particularly if you are not sure who you can trust including yourself, because all trust issues are fundamentally one of whether you can trust your own judgment, you mm. are going to run into difficulty making choices that you are willing to back up. And I certainly, I do not have a vetting process that works the way I would like it to with regard to other people. And I'm still working on that on the question of trust or distrust, the other end of the action idea, I am also given to inaction more than I would like, but I have more confidence than at least some people I know that if I get myself into a horrible snarl, I will learn things untangling myself from that. That there will be value in me figuring my way out of whatever bog I managed to fall into. Hmm. 
just to say a bit more about the the distrust and community bit of, of and friendship as well, just to get this on record, I think that um, I th this is something that I bet is like blindingly obvious to many people, but uh, was not to me first time. And it might be a way in which I was catastrophically stupid in at least one critical way uh, to use your phrasing. Um, hmm. But I think that there are, um, well, to back it up, I, I mean, one of the values that I hold very highly is friendship and like trying to be a good friend to others and also like, you know, choosing people to be friends that I think can be good friends to me. And that's something that I put a lot of time and energy and effort into and um, noticing ways that in my current living situation, I'm not able to be as good a friend to the people that I care about as I might like. Like, you know, I move from place to place. So, you know, if you and I lived in the same city, want as I might, you know, as much as for as much as I might want to be a good friend to you, um, like if, if we lived in the same city, say you got sick, I could come and take care of you. But because I move around from time to time uh, frequently, uh, I can't be a good friend to most people in that way because odds that I'd be in their city when they're sick are low. Um, and in a similar way, I think noticing that for as much as I might like people on Twitter and enjoy spending time with them, uh, there's just a whole swath of ways in which like excellent friendship uh, is, is manifested in a world that just aren't logistically available to people on Twitter. That is interesting. I think there is, I find myself frustrated at my own finitude, my limitations, the fact that I do not have infinite energy to offer to all the people that I find interesting and worth knowing. And Twitter sharpens some of that, enhances some of that feeling for me. Absolutely. Was there more you're going to say about that? Yeah, I like. I have a lot of. I have a tendency to wax poetic about the idea of uh, creativity flourishing within constraints, and I think it applies to human relationships in that knowing your limitations and what you can offer people can make it possible for you to invest in what you can offer what people you are capable of influencing and that your, your relationships can do best if you are aware of the ways that you are constrained and you make intentional choices in light of that and i think I mean, obviously the first step towards that is being aware of what you can't do so there is wisdom in being able to identify even things like what you're saying there with ways that moving around limits the kind of friendships you would like to offer people but makes it possible opens up ways for you to innovate on how to be a good friend within those constraints yes definitely it makes me want to ask, are there any ways that uh, you think that you show up as a friend for the people in your life that are unusual or not obvious about like things that you believe about being a good friend that you are able to demonstrate in unusual ways? It's always hard to know how unusual I am. Hmm. And like, I, th I think it's healthy to have some reticence about classifying your unusual positive qualities. So with a grain of salt, I will say, I think listening well matters a lot to me and it is a skill I have invested a great deal of time in. So it matters to me that when my friends tell me about things that especially are painful for them, but in general matters to them, I have put a lot of work into reflecting back what they're saying to really trying to get at the meat of what matters to them and how they're feeling about whatever story they're experiencing and offering them the kind of complex emotional and logistical support that I value 
in other people and that I find is incredibly rare. I do not live up to these standards, but they are important to me. I also think I orient my friendships with some pretty strong ideas about this phrase shows up again and again, what I owe to other people and what I owe to myself. And that includes things like when I step over lines and when I do things that I know were less than the virtues that I aspire to, I reach out to my friends and I tell them that like, and I will inform them that I've fallen short, that I want to make it better. I think showing up for people and making them feel seen is simpler than some people think if you are capable of putting enough of yourself aside without erasing yourself entirely. That phrase about uh, what you owe to yourself and what you owe to others, you've mentioned that a few times and of course that comes up on your count as well. And um, I, I'm really getting the sense that that's at the core of, or at least a, a, a large part of uh, the sort of ethical worldview that I see you uh, holding and espousing and that feels so, you know, uh, both sort of foreign to me and uh, like interesting and like valuable to my own sort of, uh, I would say like ethical education basically. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'd love to ask more about that. And maybe just to start, like, wh what would you say, I, I think you've talked to, f to some extent about what you owe to others, but what would you say you owe to yourself? I think that you owe yourself a certain measure of human dignity. You need to be aware of when other people are treating you inconsiderately or as less than you deserve. I'm not, I'm not even perfectly attuned to this and anyone who has seen me on Twitter would say that I certainly am not great at offering this to other people unilaterally, but a value that I hold is that you should be aware of what you have a right to expect from other people is, includes a certain level of basic dignity, basic humanity. I think something that you owe to, you know what? I have a word doc about this. Let me go get this. I have an entire word doc that I wrote out of here are what my values are. Because mm -hmm. Mormonism was certainly really involved in me trying to figure out how to retool my worldview after losing all of it, all at once. And one of the critical features for me was identifying a value system that I could consistently live up to that mattered to me. And I wrote out, I found that the way that I could most easily grab onto this concept of here's what matters to me, here's what I think I, how I think I should act, it was a basic framework of here are the things I owe to myself and here are the things I owe to other people. And I found that many of them were mirrors of each other. So... I'm trying to open this. There's a possibility that I got, like I have it, I'm looking at it, but there's a possibility that I can't open it anymore because, hey yo, we're in business. Okay. So um, this, this document is titled Values and it starts with me talking about a baseline concept of I'm response. So, if I read it, I'm responsible for my self, sense of self. It shouldn't come from my partner, my accomplishments, my appearance, my job, my rep relationships, or my reputation. It should come from living with integrity. 
And living with integrity means that my actions and my values are morally aligned as much as possible. I should stand behind challenging decisions that are rooted in core values, even when they have a cost to me. I should unreservedly and proactively apologize for and rectify decisions that don't support my values, even when that has a cost to me. And then I have my values are rooted in what I owe to others and what I owe to myself. And so the what I owe to myself list, as I say, they, these lists mirror each other. They, they, they sort of point for point go in, in mirrors. So the what I owe to myself list is honesty, grace, following through on stated commitments, self-knowledge sufficient to know my limitations and from there to create boundaries, a willingness to question others, to strive to eliminate beliefs that do harm or do not serve me, seeking to use my talents in a way that broadens my sense of meaning and happiness in life. I forgot that I wrote this in such a wordy way. I don't know why I'm surprised by this. Positive efforts to remind myself of my worth as a person, daily physical, emotional, and mental caretaking, and acknowledging and thoroughly utilizing my capacity to choose. And what do you owe to others according to that document? <laughs> so what I owe to others is respect for their autonomy, respect for stated boundaries, grace, honesty, following through on stated commitments, making my boundaries clear, a willingness to question my feelings and perspectives so that I don't privilege my limited view, seeking to use my talents in a way that benefits others, positive efforts to remind them, parentheses, in ways they will find comfortable and helpful, of their worth as a person and of their importance to me in particular, and physical, emotional, and mental support within my limitations. Wow. That's beautiful to hear that, my friend. It's, thank you for sharing it. Is there anything else in there that uh, you'd like to share? Is that is that the whole of the thing? Let me see. There's a whole list of me trying to go through some fundamental principles and then outlining some of my weak points, which are those are considerably more personal, so I wouldn't be able to talk about them. Mm -hmm. But I just want to open this document and see you. It's funny to see some of it. Those are that's kind of the meat of me trying to work out. I was aware that I had a fledgling sense of ethics that was slowly being reborn after leaving Mormonism. And I had a relationship that really that ended extremely poorly and pushed me into trying harder to make those values and that ethical system more explicit to me in hopes that I would make better choices and avoid the choices that were harmful to me in the future. Hmm. Can you say more about what grace means to you? I think that it is fundamentally cruel to interact with other people without an awareness that no one is ever perfect and that people are often hurting significantly and even if they're not in enormous pain they are often frustrated or dealing with limitations that they didn't choose and so all of these lofty ideas about how people should act and how i should act are just a stick to beat other people with unless and myself with unless i maintain some awareness of the fact that no one can be perfect all the time and that everyone deserves to have some level of slack for the things that they can't control and the ways that makes it harder for them to be the kind of person they could be. Um, I don't know. I feel very touched by this as a whole, but uh, that, uh, I find myself very moved by hearing you say that. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, yeah, um, 
this is something both I want to feel fully in my heart, but also I think there's some wisdom in there for me. And um, I think what's coming up is both that this quality of grace that you point to is something that I really long for from others and I'm, I'm really hungry for people receiving me in that way. Uh, and also at the same time, uh, feel like it's a beautiful articulation of something I could aspire to and strive to embody myself of, uh, having this particular flavor of compassion for others of, yeah, it almost sounds like to one, I don't know, I would sort of paraphrase some of what I'm hearing and this may not be accurate for you, but partially like holding people to high standards, including yourself, but then also having an acknowledgement of the reality of where you or others might be at and being able to hold both of those at the same time. I, I, I don't know if you would uh, agree with that, but that's part of what I'm hearing. Very much so. I think that paradox is particularly visible in Mormon eschatology, and I kind of carried it with me. Uh, Mormonism focuses a lot on right action in a way that also sometimes gets us criticism from other Christians because we all we almost believe that you have to keep the commandments follow the standards in order to be saved we do believe that actually hmm. but so this this gets the suggestion that we don't believe adequately in the sacrifice of Christ. But especially when I was faithful, I found that it was possible to hold both of these ideas simultaneously, that you should aim as high as you possibly can, and that you should also be as gracious with yourself and with other people as you can afford to be. And it's often very difficult to find that balance at the margins and the fundamental attribution error is essentially leading too much for grace for yourself and leading too much towards high standards for other people. And I don't know that I do as good of a job. No, I know that I don't do as good a job of being fair to other people as I want to be. And I am often gracious with myself when I shouldn't be. But I do believe that having this ideal to aspire to matters. And I think it is very possible to work really hard to be the best and kindest and most loving version of yourself and also recognize that you will not be perfect and that you can bring something more whole to the world in your imperfection than you could if perfection were possible. Is there a word for uh, the sort of counterpart of grace of holding yourself or others to high standards? It's a little tinge with unfortunate associations, but accountability is the first one that comes to mind. Responsibility is a cousin that is a little more associated with red tribe than blue tribe, which accountability is more a blue tribe again, associated mm. word. Mm. Mm. I imagine integrity would fit in this general sphere as well. I think so. I think of integrity as fundamentally being about consistency. And I think of responsibility and accountability as being about taking initiative to act mm. on what you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me if any examples come to mind of what it might look like to embody grace with others and be gracious towards others? 
I would say that a lot of my listening skills come from a belief that grace is partially offering people space to be messy in because everybody will be messy sometimes and given the right kind of structural support most people can get out of their messiness better if they have a safe space to do it so i think of one of the ways that i offer grace to people most immediately on a more intimate level is by letting them tell me instances where they were messy or where they are falling short of who they would want to be and telling them it is okay your story matters this is the sort of thing that happens sometimes and you are not broken forever nor are you terrible, unredeemable, or any other <laughs> horrible adjective because you're not who you wish you were right now. And I think that seeing the potential and the good in other people when they struggle to see it themselves is particularly a generous and loving thing to do if you can mm -hmm. offer it honestly, which is crucial. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you sharing those examples. And yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm imagining that on the other side of you know, accountability or responsibility or sort of like integrity. Um, I'm imagining that that's connected to some of what we talked about earlier and uh, you allude to in a few points, but of, um, I, you know, earlier I was talking about the optimal amount of upsetting people is not non-zero. Yeah. And I um, want to talk about that tweet. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to say more about that? Yeah, I think part of integrity is going to mean that you're going to bother people sometimes. You cannot mm -hmm. stand up for what is right without pissing people off. Mm -hmm. You should be very cautious to associate pissing people off with doing the right thing. That's a very real failure mode. I have it, obviously. But it's important to know that when you stand up for what is right, there will be people who do not like it. You often, you will often find yourself in a situation where standing up for what is right, particularly standing up for yourself, for saying the way you are treating me is not appropriate, it's not acceptable. That, that is not something people are going to respond to in a, you're very right. And I am very happy that you said that. <laughs> and I, I'm going to change everything that I'm doing now because you said that it's fundamentally not how people work. Any mm -hmm. pushback that you offer on someone will generally be met with equal and opposite pushback. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be wrong sometimes and you're going to have to navigate that. But I think a major failure mode that I saw in Mormonism culturally that was much less common in my family of origin uh, because I have a mother who is not afraid of pissing people off, is that if you are determined to make things look like they're okay, there is a lot of potential for enabling a lot of evil if you are not willing to stand firm and say bullshit sometimes. <laughs> and I think people can let themselves off the hook for standing by and watching people do bad shit hmm. because they can tell themselves that the higher good is not making people upset. And I have a particular contempt for the idea that people's discomfort should be privileged over stepping in to say, this is not right. It cannot continue as it is. Hmm. You mean their comfort? Or, yes, I suppose. Uh, like, for privileging the, like, by using the word discomfort, I'm pointing to, suggest like, making someone uncomfortable would mm -hmm. be worse mm -hmm. than, mm -hmm. yeah. So yes. you're not always keeping someone comfortable by not saying anything. 
it's not the most important distinction, but hmm. yeah. I, I want to ask more about and, and maybe even push you on what you said of uh, I've, I, that this is, I believe you used the word that this is fu fundamental. People are fundamentally going to push back if you call them on something. Uh, do, you, do you really agree with that or is it more just more often, most often the case that people will push back? It's probably closer to the latter, that it's more often the case that people will push back. However, I think we started talking about Mormonism and now I'm tempted to drag it in at every corner. Feel so free, my friend. Me. Um, Mormons will talk about the quote unquote natural man sort of tendencies that you are given to exhibiting in the absence of trying to reach for a better self. And I would square the circle of, is this fundamentally how people are versus is this something people usually do with saying that I think everybody comes with a built in Hmm, safety response system for their ego that says if somebody attacks you on a character level counter strike before you before you think about whether that's true and it's very possible to learn how to train yourself out of that and some people come with much stronger hardware for counter striking than other people do some people are much more given to impulsively saying absolutely not of course i'm right and you're wrong than others i do think it's a pretty natural human thing to in the face of an accusation that you are less than you would like to be to say absolutely not even if you only say that within yourself and not out loud and i mm -hmm. think you can grow beyond it but most people have that, if not everyone. Hmm. Yeah, part of the reason I ask is, it certainly seems true to me in my experience that most people, certainly including myself, push back. On the other hand, I think it's a mark of virtue to be able to skill, skillfully receive ethical feedback and not get defensive or angry and simply listen to and uh, inquire about the feedback that's given. And uh, similarly, I think there's also a skill to giving someone feedback ethically. And I've seen <laughs> yeah. it done where like, uh, it's, I wouldn't say this is a skill that I have in great strength, but that you can give someone ethical feedback on their actions or character in a way that uh, uh, sort of diffuses the possibility that someone's ego would dismantle it so so they're able to hear it and receive it in a way that's useful without even really giving them the opportunity to get defensive and that that I think is a virtue worth cultivating as well I think so clearly that's not I privilege truth telling over truth telling in a way that will land gently especially for people I don't know well I could defend that if I wanted to but I do think there is value in being able to encourage people to do better than they're currently doing in a way that makes them feel seen and understood and invited to be better rather than condemned. Yeah, I think, um, and you know, I certainly tend to be overly nice and could stand to be less nice. And that's something we might come back to. But uh, just talking about it sort of abstractly, I think that the the reason to do that is less to be nice or or even kind is and more that um, practically, you know, if you just tell someone, I think you were a jerk, you shouldn't have done that. Here's why. Like, yeah, if if the most common response is to just deflect that, then that's not useful because they're not actually going to hear what you're saying or be able to act on it in a useful way. But if you can say it in a way that, um, you know, is received well, then it means that it will actually be more likely to be uh, integrated in a useful way that does affect their actions. Yes. It's an interesting parallel between 
lifting someone out of a funk where they know they're not doing as much as they want to, but they can't figure out how to stop and calling someone's attention to something that they're falling short of that's hurting other people in that you want to be able to thread a needle where you are reaching them as they are, where you can tap into how they see themselves. I suck at this, by the way, in terms <laughs> of telling someone that they're falling short. Like, I want to be real clear. People are listening to me being like, hmm, this is how you should act. You're going to see you never act like that. Correct. <laughs> I think that there is value in being able to talk to someone that shows that you understand where they are right now and be able to encourage them to be more of their better self with that knowledge of their internal, better, nobler soul. Is there a time where you feel you've done this well? Um, there are times I have done it better than other times. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would go so far as to say that I've ever done it well because my value system does, I mean, I, I said this earlier, it might be worth revisiting, but I do come at the question of someone's doing something wrong and harmful to other people from a question of how you feel about hearing that information is not a high priority for me. And I don't care if you think this should be. <laughs> so my tendency is not to usually say this in a way that I think will be received well, which is certainly both noticeable and not something I will argue is unilaterally a virtue of mine. And it, the priority is much more, you are doing something shitty. I am looking at it you should stop. This information is now yours to deal with. Hmm. Good luck. Hmm. Hmm. What I do you can think? be gentle in some cases, but I'm certainly hmm, not always. When you recall the times that you did it better, what do you think characterized those times? A much stronger connection to the person and a more collaborative approach to problem solving. Hmm. One of, I was wrong to have acted in this way in whatever disagreement we had. Hmm. I cannot, I, I was wrong to have acted this way and I cannot accept this particular behavior to continue as it has been. What can we do about that? Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think for me, times when someone has done this well for me, uh, typically involve this sort of grace quality that you talk about of, um, you know, it's not like a attack or a blame thing, but more just matter of fact, and also includes a sense of kindness and um, perspective of where I might be coming from. And and it, where you can really feel loved by the person that they uh, still love you and uh, appreciate you and value you. And uh, those moments have been really sweet, really, actually, to receive that kind of feedback from someone. And it's a very intimate thing and sort of bonding and connecting. And, and in some ways, um, I think I'm noticing I really value this in a, in, in a true friend as someone that uh, would give me this kind of ethical feedback. and give it in, like they, they wouldn't um, hide or shirk away from uh, giving ethical feedback and they would step up to do so in a way that was just sort of like unconditionally loving and kind and um, sweet. And I also, I mean, just practically, I know that I and many other people that I know prefer to receive that kind of feedback privately. And that I think that just tends to go better um, practically speaking, but um, there's a real art to it, I think, to sharing or receiving this kind of feedback. And in a way, I think that's, um, for me at least, an essential part of true friendship. That's interesting. 
I can understand that perspective. Does it feel different from yours? Very much so. Mm -hmm. I value honesty and authenticity in how I present myself such that I don't think I could present feedback like that in a way that I would consider true. Hmm. It really depends on what the person is doing. Hmm. I'm not sure that I would categorize feedback on, hey, you are harming other people as loving because hmm. it would be dishonest of me to suggest that I could interface with that choice in a way that was loving. I think the closest you would get is understanding. And even that would be, so I can see why you made the choice that you did. What does loving mean to you there? I I think at least for this specific context, I'm thinking of loving as including a level of affection that I cannot imagine authentically be, being present in this. Would it be fair to substitute it with the word sweet? So, uh, mm, I, I suppose if I'm saying I cannot imagine being loving in this way, then if you say, if I were to say, I cannot imagine being sweet in this way. Yes, emphatically, I would say those are replaceable mm -hmm. ideas. Yeah. Because I, I, at least from the way I was hearing you talk about it, uh, I was imagining that you would have difficulty being sweet, but that the thing that I'm, I would be asking a friend for in this kind of situation, and to me, it feels loving. Like I, in myself, want to be a good person and want to ask ethically and to receive feedback about how I can do that better, even if it's uncomfortable, is deeply kind because it's helping me to be a better person. And I think um, it is that for others as well to like help try to prevent them from taking actions that are harmful and to help them steer them towards actions that are helpful it does feel sort of like kind, even if it's not sweet. I do think it is kind. I think how I model that for myself is mm -hmm. that I try to show myself the kindness of being honest about my many flaws. Mm. And in response, I try to meet that honesty with some degree of resilience. As in, I have found from observing the people in my life and I want to be clear that this is not how I think you necessarily act. I am, I do not want to, this to be seen as something that I think you do. Uh, this is more just where my concept of resilience in the face of criticism is a kindness you show to someone that you receive criticism from. Hmm. And I, I have seen in my life multiple people who, when you try to say, hey, stop doing this. You are hurting me. They, they might fire back defensively, but there is also a sort of like lay dead position that happens as well, where people will be like, you know what? Yeah, I'm a terrible person. I can't do anything right. I've always been awful. You're so right. I am the worst person ever and you deserve so much better. This is also fucked up. That is mm -hmm. some bullshit. That is not taking responsibility. And mm -hmm. if you fall to pieces under someone telling you, hey, you fucked up, garbage. I do not have patience for that at all. Mm -hmm. I hate it. So I also think it is valuable within myself to develop some steeliness around being able to hear that things are wrong with me. That sometimes I do things I do hurt other people and that it is a service to someone who is alerting this to me, like <laughs> bringing this to my attention to be able to receive that with sturdiness, with structure, without making them responsible for me being upset that they told me I'm hurting other people. I mm. don't think that is a moral or ethical way to respond to, hey, you're hurting other people. I think... And especially, you'll note that I'm making a distinction between supporting someone who is 
caught in self-destructive loops and someone who, while they might be caught in self-destructive loops, is actively hurting other people around them. Hmm. Um, I think that to the extent you are hurting other people, uh, you, you should expect that people will bring that to attention, your attention in ways that you're not going to like and you should be able to cultivate enough of a sense of self that you can evaluate that earnestly, even if it comes to you in a way that is hard to hear. Hmm. Hmm. The failure mode of this is that you sometimes become too suggestible to ideas that there's something really wrong with you. I'm still working on this, but yes, clearly I feel very strongly about this. I do not care for a tendency to fall apart and play dead in the face of, hey, you did this thing, it was not good. Do not do that thing again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it strikes me as a kind of defense mechanism to just admit wrongdoing because it sort of, in a way, like absolves you from, could it could absolve you from fixing it of like, oh yeah, I'm just bad because then I'm perpetually bad and I'll always make this mistake and I always, you know, I always have and I always will. I'm just bad. Now, and you found me out. Thanks for calling me on it. Yeah, there's a sense of uh, profoundly useless fatalism in this response. <laughs> Uh -huh. of like and I clearly have great contempt for this I feel <laughs> very strongly about that uh but yeah it's an easy ripcord to pull to say you're right I am bad I have always been bad this is who I am my choices are immaterial they're always going to be bad because I'm bad so thank you for telling me my choice was bad I knew it was bad because I am bad everything I do is bad I'm glad we had this chat. You're clearly doing very well with with your whole thing. It's tough. Oh, oh man. Oh, man. I, this makes me want to ask. I feel like um, uh, one of the questions I want to ask you is about snark, because I, I <laughs> at least uh, perceive some of your tweets to be snarky, if you don't mind me saying so. And uh, I, it's, it's a quality that I've really come to enjoy this year and almost... Uh, um, how to say, let myself indulge in on occasion, uh, as I think you know. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, do you see snark as uh, a virtue or a vice, or what is what is snark? And uh, is it? I, I'm almost curious of is there some kind of steel man for the value of snark? That is an interesting question. The snark is a power that gets excused when it is misused because people don't recognize it for being as powerful as it is. Hmm. You can get under people's skin being snarky in a way that you can't using a lot of other communication styles. And uh, it's, as I say, I would orient to it not necessarily as a virtue or a vice so much as a weapon, a power, something that can be used to sharpen a good statement into something that is funnier than it was, something that can sharpen self-deprecation into something that is sweeter and funnier and goes down easier because it's a little sharp-edged. Mm. And it's also something that you can use this makes me sound more calculating than I think I am. I just naturally, like speaking in snark is like being snarky. It comes very naturally to me. It's always huh. been, huh. Uh, it has long been a really notable feature of how I talk. And I So do I'm not off it. base in saying I might detect some snark on occasion from you. I think it's really funny, actually. First of all, to say that in a, such a tentative way, because <laughs> I think, I, <laughs> I, I think, while plenty of people would use different words, um, I'm not sure most people would disagree that my tweets are often snarky. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's also funny because I am extremely aware that the way I write is at least as blunt, if not blunter, than how I talk. But when I speak, I bring a particular tone to my 
obnoxious choices of words to sort of soften them and to make them funnier and even in some cases to sort of poke fun at myself for taking such a strong position. And I know that none of that is present in text and sometimes it is genuinely funny to me to know that I come across so much sharper than I do in person because mm. that vocal tone is missing. Mm. I'm aware of it and I don't correct for it because it's just sort of funny to me. But I also <laughs> have found that you can get away with things if you are annoying people in a way that you can't if you were more openly trying to combat them. Uh, I, I'm not going to defend this as like a noble uh, just like war strategy, by the way. This is just kind of a default for me. Um, I, I'm a youngest child. I grew up in a distinct like no holds barred, nobody is going to be careful with you, hierarchical kind of family structure. And I found that there were many ways that I lacked power. I, I was physically smaller than almost everyone in my family. I was the youngest, so my brain development was behind everybody else's, and I was a girl. And there was just this sense of not like it was not being listened to, not being taken seriously and lacking power in so many ways. And I found that I could irritate my family members <laughs> as intentionally as a way of um, getting back at them that would not be traced back to me. Like it mm. was just something that I seemed to just sort of be doing accidentally as opposed to a very intentional retaliation because there were very few ways for me to actively hit back at someone who was harming me. So I learned to get under people's skin and to <laughs> like get in around sensitive corners in ways that will annoy people that will also, I should not be this on it. <laughs> but I'm aware that it's possible to annoy people in ways that they will look less dignified if they kick back at because being annoying is not something that is considered a source of power, which means that you can abuse it without getting caught mm. Mm. or mm. called out for it. Mm. Fascinating. It's a very different, I mean, I'm an only child for one, so I feel <laughs> like that's a whole suite of uh, dynamics and perhaps uh, you could say skills that I never really cultivated. I, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, it almost seems like when, when I meet people or have friends that uh, had siblings, uh, it seems like there's this like very common love language of like uh, what I experience as bullying each other, but it's sort of like poking fun at each other or, uh, you know, pulling each other's legs in a certain way. And I'm always like, why are, why, why are you doing that? Uh, but it seems like a, a, a sort of, uh, I don't know, like bonding thing if you're, if you have siblings and uh, that seems sort of similar, like, oh, as the youngest child, uh, I could, you know, uh, have some agency by being really annoying in a certain way. Yes. I mean, I may not be able to get somebody else to backtrack or reconsider their thoughts or listen to me at all, but I definitely can make them just as unhappy as I am. Mm -hmm. So... But yes, there's also, it can be loving mm -hmm. to prod people mm. and then mm. smile and joke about it when they, when you get someone's hackles up just a little. Mm. Uh, coming back to the more general case, I, you said um, somewhere else, you said you can only be so moral without being able to deal with anger. And you sort of uh, talked about that a little bit here, but can you say more about why that would be the case? I think people's ethics have this massive hole where anger should be. Hmm. There's, there's this tendency to think of anger as almost something you should not ever be feeling. Like good people don't feel anger is something that a remarkable number of people seem to genuinely believe. 
And I believe that there are people with a temperament such that they don't feel anger very often. And I think that there are benefits to that. However, for the general case, I would say that everybody needs to know how to deal with who they are when they get angry. And also, you need to be able to, again, I'm very good with theory. I'm not as good with practice, just for the record. But like you, you also want to be aware of the ways that anger serves you because it alerts you to your values and to where people are potentially stepping on you in ways that they shouldn't be. And you've got to be cautious with anger because it sometimes tells you things that aren't true or it sometimes exaggerates things, distorts and distends the real picture such that you lose track of what your piece of conflict is. I am no stranger to that, obviously, but if you take this highbrow 30,000 feet sort of good people don't feel anger approach, then you have this devastating weak place where anger goes. Because even if you're not the type of person to get angry, you will have to deal with angry people sometimes. And if you work under the assumption that anger is always a symbol of wrongness, of weakness, of unfairness, then there is a great possibility that you will perpetuate injustice under the guise of moral superiority. Hmm. You need to be capable of receiving anger and dealing with it. And you also need to know who you are when you are angry and know to the best of your ability the difference between anger that is telling you the truth and anger that is telling you what you want to hear. Hmm. This is definitely a, a challenge for me. I've been very afraid of people being angry at me. And I think as a consequence of that, uh, uh, have felt uncomfortable being angry myself. And I wonder, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, to, to sort of zoom out, I think that seems to me to be uh, sort of a dispositional difference between us as far as I can tell is you seem much more comfortable being angry and maybe, I, I don't know, maybe I'm projecting here, but receiving anger from others of, you know, maybe not that you like enjoy it or love it, but like that you're not uh, foreign to it or, or, you know, avoiding it or something like that. Um, yeah. What advice would you give to me or someone else that might be challenged by that? I don't know how effective a challenge it might be. But I think if you are temperamentally less given to anger, you want, I would say that one of the ways to explore it as a concept would be to wait for authentic anger to come up and to learn to sit with it within yourself first because that's much safer than anger that comes from somebody else so if you if you find experiences where you are angry it also depends on what like the immediate response to it is but i found that a lot of people who are afraid of anger tend to shove it away like it is some kind of catching infectious disease that they need to remove from themselves as quickly as possible. Whereas I think there is utility, if you can, to sit with your anger and say, what values is this alerting me towards? And what ways is this anger, what ways does this anger make sense? Because all feelings have a rational kernel to them. That does not mean that they are telling you true things, but all feelings connect real world events in a rationally coherent way that may just be missing from outside perspective. So what ways does this anger make sense? And then what ways is it encouraging me to be unfair? From those valuations, you can distill, what is this anger trying to tell me? And is there anything I can use from this response? And there frequently is. 
what about for um, receiving others' anger? I was going to talk about that. Mm. That's funny. Um, I think with more comfort with internal anger, I would expect it to get easier to deal with other people mm. who are angry because the more that you treat your own anger as something that has something valuable to tell you, even if it comes in a prickly spiny package the more when somebody comes to you angry you can ideally be able to pick out pieces where you can say i understand why you feel that way i can make sense of the reason that is a piece of your anger and i can point it out to you that i am making sense of it that i see it i can see where this anger came from in your value system i can see where this anger came from in the good of you and from there you can use it the same skill set to say what can i distill this into that we can use to build a better connection hmm. <laughs> because There are many true things that will be unpleasant to hear or to learn about. And I think anger is one interpersonal way that that is often true. Hmm. That's fascinating because I, I've always had a hard time receiving others' anger. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily have framed it in terms of having difficulty uh, expressing anger although I, I don't think I was like exceptionally good at that but you know I, I think that my default is to avoid expressing it and just sort of uh, transmute it internally or even repress it internally and uh, it's, it's interesting that the way that you suggest uh, being able to receive it better is to be able to uh, discern the value of one's own anger and so that you can recognize that in others. Ideally and mm -hmm. I should be clear, I mean, I speak so confidently about how I think things should work. That confidence may be felt, but I am certainly not an expert on the world or on anyone but myself. And mm -hmm. my ideas, if they are found to not be, to lack utility by other people, I would not be very surprised. And I don't, I don't know. I reserve the right to speak with extreme confidence while also saying that I don't know that any of it is not bullshit. So, sure. I mean, that's well seen and well said. At the same time, uh, I have this tweet about uh, there's a way in which when someone asks you a vulnerable question, that you have the answer to that. And uh, I really try to ask questions that I feel someone will say something useful about, if if only to me. And so. Um, you know, I'm asking you one of those kinds of questions and you're giving me an answer that I feel is, is useful to me. So, uh, you know, may, maybe I imagine that part of that is, uh, oh, maybe maybe worrying that of how it will come across to someone listening to this, but, uh, you know, it's sort, it's sort of a response to a question that I'm asking and, uh, you know, it's my, my question and I'm finding what you're sharing to be very valuable. So I want to make that explicit and say that I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's that's very considerate. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Well, and I say that to you, but also uh, to someone listening, because I don't know uh, if they judge Eurydice as being arrogant or overly confident on my show, that's their problem. So <laughs> mm. I think, I don't know. I think I could make, I could steal man the case for me being arrogant or overly confident. There are, I could steal man most arguments for my failing. <laughs> I think. Hmm. Hmm. I feel like, uh, as you say that, um, how to put it, you seem uh, quite ready to admit your own failings morally. And I suspect this is, this is coming from the part of me that's cultivated the capacity to distrust people over time, which is a new thing for me. But um, I suspect, how to put this, that it will take me time to discern how you actually hold that and not just in words, but, uh, you know, because because that kind of thing could, for example, be a defense mechanism or just a habit of something, or I think it could really indicate a real virtue on your part of, oh, I'm able to 
look at my own moral failings. And uh, I think that that sort of thing is borne out in time and action and real situations rather than uh, just words. It's, it's easy to say things that sound virtuous, but uh, the way that you act really demonstrates that. And so I'm filing away a curiosity of, uh, you know, I, I suspect my, my previous inclination would be like, oh, this, this really demonstrates a virtue on your disease part and that she's able to acknowledge her own moral flaws and failings. And, um, you know, I know over here, that's something I can stand to cultivate. And so I appreciate hearing that from you and also honoring this, uh, what I call dark part that's able to say like, oh, well, let's see in time how she uh, acts in situations that really matter. I would really encourage people to take that sort of view to me or anyone else. Talk is cheap. Mm -hmm. It's easy for me to say that I have this or that feeling. I am consistently worse at addressing my feelings than I wish I were. And I believe very strongly in the autonomy of other people to observe how I act and make their own choices about how they interact with me in response. So for example, I have had people on Twitter say, come to me, I think this is, I think this is slightly more common as a personality type around here, uh, where people will come to me with this sort of like, you know, you're a lot like you're you're pretty intense you're pretty harsh you were pretty unfair that was you got into this argument in this really extreme way i'm not sure how i feel about that and people will approach me occasionally with these kinds of ideas uh with the subtext and sometimes the explicit text being can i trust you should i trust you since you're acting like this and i have a tendency to flip that back and say I want you to make that calculus based on my choices. Mm -hmm. I do mm -hmm. not want to tell you how you should think of me as a person. I want you to decide <laughs> whether you want to interact with someone who acts like me. And you, you see the behavior, you get to decide. I do not deserve your trust. Mm -hmm. If you watch how I act and you say, I don't think I trust that person, that should be good enough reason not to trust me. Mm -hmm. um, I do not want to be in the business of telling other people that they should overlook my flaws because I would like them to like me anyway. Hmm. I want people to make their own judgments about whether they interact with me despite my genuine limitations. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Well, two things about that. One, I feel like in, in general, it seems like uh, sort of a, a uh, almost like unforced error or, or category mistake to let someone else decide whether you should trust them. Uh, and then I'd say in this context, um, you know, just in general, when I have someone on the show and, and even more broadly, when I interact with people, I really feel that uh, there's something that everyone can teach me and that I can learn something from everyone. And uh, it's very clear to me interacting with you over the past few months that there's a lot that I can learn from you. And part of the reason to have this conversation is to uh, sort of uh, dive deeper into what it is that I could learn from you and, and see what virtues you do have. And, you know, often people aren't uh, able to uh, see for themselves what their positive qualities are or virtues, or, or they're not able to uh, explain them directly. And so I think it sort of interview conversation can be one way of getting at that and revealing those things. And um, I don't know, I, I to me, it's like something like uh, how to put it for me. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess, oh, how to put this? In general, I'm learning how to trust people and when to trust people and when not to trust people and how. And uh, that certainly applies to you uh, because I don't know you very well, but also, um, it is clear to me that you have uh, virtues that I can learn from and uh, things that I can uh, benefit from hearing from you. And so uh, it's just a matter of what those things are and how to integrate them and uh, digest them and, uh, you know, sort of receive that wisdom from you. And uh, that's something I'll still be digesting after our conversation as well. But, uh, you know, 
how to, yeah, something like, even if I were to distrust you in certain ways, well, some of them would just be, again, sort of coming back to like categorically of like, you know, I, I couldn't trust you to take care of me if I was sick, for example, that's just a simple example. But um, uh, uh, even more importantly, even if there were ways that I distrusted you that were specific to you, there, that wouldn't preclude me from learning things from you or, or benefiting from being in connection or friendship with you. That's something I'm always trying to expand my capacity for is seeing the value in things that bother me and things that I find limited and seeing the limitations in things that I really like. And that mm. applies to people too, mm. because I think it can be very difficult to appreciate people and ideas in their full complexity. I don't know if people can do that, but I am always trying to expand my ability to handle the complexity of people who are capable of both great, good, and bad. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of at least three or four things that I would love to ask you more about and talk to you more about. I think we might be coming up on the limits of our conversation for today. So uh, I wonder, I just want to give you space. Is there anything else that you'd like to say more about or talk more about before we close our conversation? I'm a little curious. You pulled out several tweets that reference theory of mind, and I was curious mm -hmm. to hear what you wanted to know about those. I don't know if you want to get into that, but that mm -hmm. was something I was interested in. Yes, this is one of the things. Yeah, let's let's definitely talk about that then. I think um, theory of mind is a recurring interest for me personally, um, and I think for for multiple reasons, but partly uh, in connection with ethics, which is you know a lot of what we've been talking about. And um, I think uh, for me, uh, I, I think I think I think of it sort of developmentally, and that some people have it and some people don't. And I think just in my own life, biographically, like I probably developed more theory of mind when I was maybe 26 or 27, and I'm 31 now, and I, I still see ways that I, I lack theory of mind or don't use it as often as I might. And I'd still like to develop it as a capacity, but it seemed like, oh, it was a thing I didn't really have very much of. And then I developed it. And so, um, and, and I really have come to value it when other people have it and uh, almost be pained when they don't of like, oh, I wish, I wish you had theory of mind right now. That would be really nice. Um, and uh, I think not having it also invites a lot of ethical problems where you hurt people without even knowing it and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I saw that you had some tweets about it and maybe I can see which of them uh, would be worth asking about. Let's see. Um, yeah, you said theory of mind is undersold as a managerial and pedagogical skill. And um, you also said uh, empathy is good, but a lot of what people mean when they talk about it is theory of mind. And many of you MFs are absolute shit at that. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you also said in the replies, there's a really interesting metaphor of empathy as to theory of mind as squares are to rectangles. Um, if you think you have empathy, but don't have theory of mind, you're just projecting and you need to stop. Um, so yeah, I don't know, just in general, if there's anything that you'd like to share about it and its value or you know your own personal experiences with it, I would love to hear about that. So, We talked about blind spots earlier. To the extent that I'm willing to be specific about blind spots, I think the idea that understanding other people is in the nice to have category rather than the absolutely essential category is a self-flattering fiction for people who don't enjoy trying to understand people who are different from themselves. Oof, oof. The sting is strong, you're in a sea. <laughs> I just, I don't have a lot of patience for the idea, which I see all the time, that trying to make space for other people is somehow less rational than 
just quote unquote cold hard facts. Hmm. How other people are is among the list of cold hard facts that are relevant for dealing with them. And I, <laughs> I find myself consistently frustrated in dealing with people who make, yes, unforced errors, foreseeably poor decisions, or should have been foreseeable, because they didn't orient to the problem in terms of, if I were this person, why would I have done this thing that they did? Or to the extent that somebody engages in that line of thinking, it terminates somewhere around because I was an idiot. Mm. Clearly, I am not immune to this intellectual roadblock. However, I think there's, it is a superpower to be able to model other people. And I think it is a logistical power in addition to a relational one. So I talked about managerial and pedagogical skills. I have found a lot, so I have, I've had a lot of experience in trying to teach other people complex concepts, both uh, as a, a TA for chemical engineering courses and in grad school as well, even when I was teaching basic lab procedures to other people. I found that other people's brains worked remarkably different from mine and using, including in this, how can I make sense of this concept? And I would find that I couldn't use the same metaphor to get somebody to hook their fingers into a meaning the way it helped bootstrap my own, bootstrap my own understanding. And the better I could get someone talking to me and telling me what they understood, the more I could use the building blocks of their responses to help guide them into a better understanding. I have lost the skill a little bit as I have done less teaching, which is a bit of a tragedy for me. Hmm. I also, I think as a manager, you do better work when you understand where limitations are coming from and why someone is doing them. And to the extent that I would put theory of mine in context with some of the things that you have mentioned as being important to you, I think one of them that I would name check specifically would be alerting someone to the harm that they're doing in a way that they will be ready to hear. That's a great example of using theory of mind to be more effective than you would be if you prioritize something other than how is this person going to receive this information. Hmm. I, I think a lot of relational problems that I see or even that I have experienced sometimes felt laughably avoidable if the person had spent two fucking seconds saying to themselves, how will this person feel about me doing this shit? It's Extraordinary, I mean, the, the reason is that there are incentives not to care about this and people prioritize other things. But fundamentally, theory of mind is an intellectual skill first and an emotional skill only in context with that. And I feel like empathy, good empathy is part of theory of mind, which is what I was getting at with empathy is to theory of mind as squares are to rectangles and there's no such thing as real empathy that can't model another person. Hmm. That's just your own feelings that you've decided to like plaster onto somebody else. That's not, you don't, if you don't understand someone, you don't understand how they're feeling axiomatically in my opinion. So I think there's a tendency to write off empathy as this way to try to bully other people into doing things your way when really being able to model why other people want things that they do can be a very valuable tool and weaving the question of empathy or theory of mind to be stocky compassion monsters or however you want to view it is to weave 
skills on the table that can do you a lot of good relationally and otherwise. Hmm. Yeah, I think practically. Hmm. One, one of the questions that I've had for a while of like, is like whether it's possible to induce theory of mind uh, externally, uh, maybe uh -huh. just, I think that's coming from like knowing people in my life that I feel don't have a very strong theory of mind of like, again, really wishing that they did. And, um, I think I'm, I, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that? I would say that a lot of how I learned to relate to other people, including a lot of my typical communication styles came from trying to do that very thing. I I have mentioned that I have a tendency to get frustrated with obvious failures, a theory of mine. So what that means in practice often, and you can see this in my tweets if you know to look for it, what that means in practice often is making a metaphor out of something that I think is obvious that for some reason is not obvious to other people and using that to communicate what the experience would be like. And usually the snark that you also mentioned is a critical feature of this sort of forcible theory of mind attempt. Uh -huh. So for example, actually, this was just a few days ago. I really hope nobody goes and looks this up. The, um, I got, <laughs> I was having a conversation with someone. I did not mean to engage the person who kept talking to me. Someone on the timeline had mentioned uh, one of their friends talking to them and saying, I'm no longer attracted to my partner. I don't want to break up with them. I think I'm going to wait until they break up with me. And this person later in the reply says, you know, this person is just afraid of hurting their partner. And I was like, bullshit no they are not they are afraid of having to do something uncomfortable they are afraid of having to be there when somebody else gets upset for a choice that they made it's not the same thing as actually caring about how this person feels and the metaphor that i used for this exact kind of forcible theory of mind implantation was like i feel like that's like slowly poisoning a pet and thinking that it's better than euthanasia like uh -huh. It's just not more humane. It requires ludicrous self-deception and incredible lack of theory of mind to think otherwise, mm. in my opinion, in my <laughs> obviously very strong opinion. And that's just one example of a lot of my verbal firepower has been built around trying to get other people to see things how I see them and to crafting metaphors to make it as clear as possible how I understand particular situations. Hmm. 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 That's interesting because I think I would have said something like you can't do it in media res, but I could see how, uh, you know, using a, a sort of forceful metaphor could ap approximate theory of mind for someone, even if they don't like actually gain the skill, it can like give them, give it to them situationally. Well, we should be clear that this is definitely aspirational on my end. This is <laughs> best a convenient excuse for being obnoxious to other people online. <laughs> but it is how I view it, even if it's not an accurate description of what's going on. Hmm. 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 Yeah, it's almost like if someone doesn't have it, you can sort of like lend it to them through a metaphor or something like that. Yes. Uh -huh. Huh. I think you can induce it um, like not in media res by telling someone about it informationally and then explaining. I mean, I think practically the way you cultivate or at least that I did was like just repeatedly imagining uh, how someone might be experiencing a situation and then also getting real time feedback about that. I mean, it was, it was circling that helped me with that. And, um, but then somebody also has to have the desire to cultivate it if they don't, which is probably the harder part of like, you can't make someone want it, especially, especially because I think experientially before you have it, if it is a sort of developmental thing, you don't really know that you don't have it or what it would be to have it or uh, want it or something like that. I mean, there was someone, just as an experiment once, I was asking someone who I judged to not have very much theory of mind 
<laughs> to, and this was maybe a dick move on my part, but you know, here we are. Uh, I was sort of like <laughs> asking them to imagine my experience in a specific situation. Um, it, uh, like to me, what seemed like a relatively simple situation, but it was clear that they, they, they sort of refused to answer the question. They're like, I can't, to them, it seemed impossible that you could even answer the question, uh, you know, like what isn't someone else experiencing? Um, it's like, oh, that you can't know. You just, it seemed like a deep belief that they have, like you can't know. Um, and uh, yeah, it was interesting to witness that. Of, uh, was, um, I think it's very hard to fathom like a cognitive or psychological capacity if you, if you just currently don't have it. I think so. I think the the desire piece always seems relevant to me, that, that portion that you mentioned about being intentional about wanting to understand other people better is critical in most cases for any meaningful change. Mm -hmm. And the forcefulness of the metaphors in this snark is an attempt to jump the activation energy barrier huh? in spite of uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. Huh. Counterproductively, probably, but that is why it exists. Huh. That's interesting because I think one of the sort of circumstances in which I learned it was, yeah, doing a lot of circling, but also in the background, I was learning to do fundraising at the time. And it just became clear to me, like, well, yeah, I was having multiple difficulties doing fundraising, but one of them was like, oh, I just don't understand how other people work generally, or like, you know, if someone had money, like how they would feel about giving it away. And like, I sort of approximated that as like, oh, they're just going to not ever want to give away money and will feel bad about giving it away, which uh, is not actually true to someone's experience who has money and wants to give it away. And so I realized like, in order to get good at this, I'm going to have to understand other people better. And that was sort of like a background motivation for me at the time. And then of course, it was like, I was looking for, um, you know, it was like, oh, I want, uh, uh, I mean, it's sort of awkward to use a money metaphor now, but that's the one that coming to mind. It's like, oh, I thought I wanted $20 and then I'm getting, you know, a million dollars because theory of mind is just invaluable in many, 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 many circumstances and not just that one particular situation I was in. That's fascinating. That is not a, an application of theory of mind that would have come to me naturally. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Me either, but I, that's sort of the situation I found myself in. And yeah, in retrospect, I'm grateful for it because uh, it's just, it's just, I, I think it's, I mean, at the end of the day, it's ultimately like an ethical skill set of like you, you if you if you don't understand other people, you can't treat them kindly, I think. Yes, I fundamentally agree with that. Hmm. Well, I should probably close. <laughs> I, I, sh I there are other things I would love to ask you about, and I've so enjoyed this conversation, but uh, we should probably close for now. But thank you so much for speaking with me, Eurydice. I really enjoyed it so much. Thank you. I appreciate it, especially. It it's been a lengthy conversation. I, I wish you luck on editing this. <laughs> mm. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. It was a good My pleasure, friend.